hear the word when you hear the word mindfulness, you don't often get the word the felt direct experiential study of states of consciousness. This is where Buddhist psychology uh, really differentiates itself from the word religious experience. Are you with me? So often in the psychedelic circles, and again, it's something I've been involved with for over 40 years. I've been very quiet about it. Over the last couple of years, I've been more vocal, primarily because I was given a script by my doctors in Hawaii and hospice for ketamine, which I'm legally able to use, which I've been microdosing for the last three years, along with 35 years of other types of dosing. But I'm going, oh my God, how interesting. Mindful intelligence, meditation, and psychedelics, the interface of those. And what makes it very interesting, unlike my own study with the world of the psychedelic renaissance, bear with me, with those in positions today of high elite power of the psychedelic assisted transformational psychology, primarily of anxiety, stress, and depression, and trauma. Then you've got the other side that deals with religious experience. What, what does that even point to? You can't get away with the word religious experience in a monastery in Burma. It's like, what do you mean by that, girl? Well, I mean that we're one with all phenomena. Really? You want to be one with Hitler and Stalin? You want to be one with the girl who's been raped? You want to have compassion. You don't want to be one with the assailant. That's a hyper projection, they call it. Hyper projection, a meta projection. So the word mindful intelligence is the study of meta projection. Mindfulness is keeping your attention on the desired object. Are you with me? That's why mindfulness today is terribly inadequate as a concept to describe its function. And I really encourage people, oh my God, halfway through the opening, we'll open it up to questions. And But where I've been trained, and I don't use the word training like I'm an expert, I'm not. I'm a absolute misfit from the West who managed for the serendipity of adventure and who knows what to find myself in the monasteries in Burma with incredibly compelling minds. And I went, this isn't Buddhism at all. I said, you got it. The Buddha didn't teach Buddhism. Monks and nuns don't teach Buddhism. What do they teach? They teach radical responsibility to your own mind. I go, wow, that yeah, that's a concomitant dimension of the intelligence of the word mindful intelligence. Wow, and so what are you pointing to? He says, sir, I understand from conversations that we had that you were trained as an artist. You like music, you like painting, you like cinema you like theater well you've been trained in visual arts visual artists if i'm not mistaken i'm a monk they use colors to paint with and those colors are often put on the word a palette well meditation and mindful intelligence and dharma intelligence is the study analogously of the states of color in your own mind, analogous to states of consciousness. Really? Yes. And what are the colors of your own mind, they would say. Meditation is, this is a very another key phrase with, with Dharma in action, meditation in action. What makes meditation real? Is being a disbeliever of systems of thought. Radical, virginal 
open-mindedness is is the basis of the integrity of self-responsibility. Whoa. And then it's the vocation of, hear me here, this is, again, I'm a real stickler with language because you must be a stickler with language. Otherwise, we assume and collude with believed projected upon definitions, which have nothing to do with perhaps the experience. But what is the direct felt experiential inhabitation of the state? So mindful intelligence functions to inhabit a state of mind rightly. You're with me? Ah, Mindful intelligence is seeing reality according to its own true nature. You can see how the word intelligence here, I'm not trying to be overly intellectual, but trying to take a very concept interior process and bring language to how it's understood. It's the language of inhabiting invisibility. Okay, why is it invisible? We can hear words through our ear. We can see each other through time and distance with our eye and color. We can touch each other on a somatic physical level. But where is consciousness? It's this invisibility that if not understood, look at the world. Everything my teachers would say comes from consciousness. Every war, every rape, every violation, every level of everything is coming from an interiority. This primordial DNA, call it whatever we want to call consciousness. Meditation, mindful intelligence, Dharma intelligence, Dhamma intelligence is the experiential felt study of invisible states of mind that can be known if you understand one quality, mindful intelligence. And that's what differentiates, I think, experiential Buddhist psychology or process-oriented Buddhist psychology, which is a phraseology, a synonym phraseology for what's known as Satipatthana Vipassana Bhavana, the Pali word for meditation, or the shortened version of the word Bhavana. I hope this is acceptable and you can hear what I'm saying and take what you can. We're going to open it up to questions. But I want to take this third installment to be as explicitly sensitive to how I inhabit the Dhamma, not to teach you anything. I want you to overhear how I think to myself. And also, we've agreed now with the, the good folks at the Sentinel in British Columbia in northern Canada, outside of the town of Caslow. In August of 2024, we're going to do a 10-day experiential retreat where we're going to be, I want to use the word, practice i'm not fond of the word practice it's i don't practice sexuality i don't practice eroticism i don't practice meditation i inhabit the vocation of its beauty it's sacred and so the word practice diminishes the word sacred for me and immediacy if you know what i mean so be very careful with your language but the retreat my only one of the next 12 months will be to put these words into intimate, felt, living reality. Okay, so looping back, I'm going to end here in the next couple of minutes. What's some takeaways from this introduction? Mindful intelligence versus the word mindfulness. Begin to examine the difference and use the word appropriate to you. States of mind, I use, I'm very fond of acronyms, SOMs, SOCs. What are your 
most desired states of mind to learn the intelligence of how they arise, how they're sustained, how they're matured, how they're misunderstood by cognitive projected bias. Call it forms of projection that mislabel a state. For example, many people think that sadness is compassion, but as a state of mind, they're very different, but they mimic each other. Sadness allows me to feel what feels to be your pain. Compassion does the same thing. But if you look carefully at sadness, it often recoils from the suffering. Compassion motivates creative action. Very different state of mind on a mindful, intelligent, meditative point of view. And you can do this by employing mindful intelligence on a repeated basis throughout the day so that your vocation is to know your mind as it's happening. Being present is, I, I use the word, please excuse me, it's kind of bullshit. Again, assassins can be present, tennis players can be present. Who can't be present, okay? Surgeons have to be present. Doesn't mean you have any wisdom. So how to inhabit your chosen states of mind. Bring it home, my teachers would say. Personalize your dharma. Okay, whoa. This comes right into what are you, and I invite you in your own notebooks. What are three, four, five, seven, eleven states of mind that you are going to inhabit, study, and make the basis of your presence with your family, with your body, with your belongings, with your hope, with your dreams, with your love, with your fears. These are my basic qualities of sanity. Authenticity. Well, what the fuck does it mean as a felt reality? Is it licensed to be a narcissist? in most cases. So authenticity must be coupled with what? Integrity. Well, where the hell is integrity in my mind? What does it feel like? How do I know it to be true? Remember that phrase, how do I know it to be true? What does the word dignity point to in an individual? My colleague and I spent 10 years interviewing Burma's most noted former prisoners of conscience. Many of them now have been re-imprisoned, executed, or disappeared since the coup d'etat in February 2021. It's a four-volume set of Burma's Voices of Freedom. I left myself out of it. I interviewed long-form interviews Many of them are Buddhists. Many of them are meditators. How do you survive 10, 20 years of isolation, imprisonment, torture, rape? Well, it's not easy, Alan. Often through humor. Often through dark, biting, radical, gallows level of satire. But the bottom line was, we refused to let the iron bar define our freedom. Hear that. That's rad to me. What does that mean? It pointed to the vocation of applied mindful intelligence, Dhamma intelligence, in direct, intimate, present time relationship. What does that mean? I dip my analogous brush of consciousness in the color of my SOM called dignity. They told me it took us some time because we're mostly externalized to learn how to occupy dignity. 
Imagine that as self-therapy. What do you do? I practice the quiet form of inhabiting my own self-respect. Flaws, inconsistencies, inadequacies, struggles, anxieties, depression, the lack of, the too much of, I feel with the art of dignity. In meditation in Burma, where I was blessed to spend a few minutes, many people were encouraged. How do I sit when I meditate? Take a physical posture that allows you the grace and the self-respect of inhabiting your own sense of dignity. Don't mimic a posture that looks like a full lotus because that's the best one or that your back is upright. Inhabit dignity, walk with dignity, eat with dignity, listen. Alan, you sound overly religious, overly preoccupied, but when people look at the amount of money they spend on overcoming their inadequacies, their traumas, their anxieties, their depressions, if all you do throughout the day when you're sitting, you're talking, you're listening to your child, you're being touched through consent by your lover, how well do you receive indignity? This is an act of self-respect. How do I bring that? to present time presence. Authenticity with integrity, with dignity. Where's the word patience in our lives? How often we're annoyed, right? By almost everything that we allow ourselves if we're not aware of expectations not being met. So the grace of patience, as I was learning it in my practice, was the ability to coexist with complexity with the heart of wanting to learn from it rather than overcome it. What a graceful state of mind. So I'm, in, I'm in inviting here, where is your color on your palette called patience, determination, who can say enough or a little about the quality of love, about generosity, of about caring? These are about seven or eight different states of mind now. And I invite you, overcome your need to be religious. This is me talking to me. Or belonging to the cult of your philosophy or your psychotherapy. And I'm going to start inhabiting my chosen states of mind. That's my dharma. That's my mindful intelligence. And I promise to, and I got to have it in the first opening. How is this done? One of the most overlooked things I've seen in my 50 years of my own so-called journey. It's a mad journey. It's how easy it is to do what we do to somehow fit in with an existing projected sense of other community or unrecognized cultural slavery, obedience. I do what I do to not be annoying, to not be triggered, to not be so seen as a maverick, a rebel, a misfit, a mad artist, all of which are cool to use as labels but I've joked over the years, uh, I'm sorry, but you think authenticity is rad? Be yourself a little bit more and you'll be sure to have less friends. No one wants you on the terms of you being you, telling the truth of your imagination, your erotic fantasies, your ideals, your craziness, your madness, your inability to be articulate, your Fuck you, man, to yourself and go like, I'm just going to be myself. I'm tired of overcoming my inabilities, my flaws, my depression. Fuck you. You can't speak this way in society. You can if you're the rage against the machine. 
Don't Kill in Our Name, which is circulating around the world right now. He was invited on in 2009 to sing on the BBC, and they said, don't use expletives. And he goes on and on about don't kill in my name, and he says, fuck you like that, and they cut him off the air. Well, where's your disobedience today? Not just talking about the madness of the Middle East or America or Canada and Trudeau's complicity with fascism, but fucking use your craziness to go mad on the landscape of truth. My last point, where is your commitment to fucking truth, man? Rather than collective obedience to pay good tax dollars, Alan, to kill in my name, to overcome my trauma in a therapist's office with some psilocybin or some ketamine. Meanwhile, I'm in denial of how my 40% of my good income, making almost nothing, goes to kill people in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, $7 trillion in my name to massacre. So it's like, Another quality of, on your palate is, what about radical self-questioning? My teachers were so fond that the calamity of the world is often cloaked behind good intentions. And the underlying state of mind, the SOM, is called MOHA, M-O-H-A in Pali. Another word for that is R-S-D. What does that mean? Radical self-deception. If only we took a collective pause right now, Mr. Biden, Mr. Netanyahu, Hamas, Hezbollah, all around the world and said, what don't I see in myself that I should see? I think women know this about women and men. Hey, dude, you just don't see what I see. And I'm not going to be here putting a bib around your psychic neck to drool all over us with your fucking nonsense. It's called RSD, radical self-deception. And why is that such the best kept secret on the planet? So I enforce people to question why isn't your RSD on your palate as a priority of your presence? And the aesthetics of presence, people struggle because they don't have access to their inner DJ. Playing music that turns them on, regardless of who's dancing and how many. That, I love those artists who were in Berlin or in Amsterdam or in Melbourne in some metaphorical underground digital cave of their own denial, but they're playing music. Oh, he may have frozen. We'll just give him a moment. This happened the last time, so he usually comes right back in. <laughs> the the ba the Bali internet connection isn't the best, so. <laughs> we got cut off there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're back. Hold on. Bear with me. <laughs> Hold on. <clears throat> so anyway, that's my rave. If you have questions, please put your hand up and I'll be happy to do my bit to <clears throat> to <clears throat> to answer them and we can dive in further from there if you want. Dana, does anyone have a question or a comment or that we can dive into? Um, not at the moment, but if, uh, Crystal okay. does. Here we go, Crystal does. Take your time, please, Crystal.
As I'm listening to you, Alan, yeah, I really am following with you along that current of reaching outside of the box. That's right. To, to go to some place that is very foreign to us, given how we've been programmed and turned out by the system. Right. right. So and, said that. and it really feels like it, for what we're facing now and and realizing how enslaved we are this will take a kind of radical surgery to go beyond that box or that frequency fence to these other realms and and states of consciousness that you're referring to and mm -hmm. I, I feel that ahead. Okay, I feel that's why a lot of um, healing or self-help modalities and spiritual paths are now obsolete because we're being called to a place that we've never been before. And so it's unchartered territory. And I'm very much interested in that and doing it through a lot of mystical or sacred or maybe even called radical art forms to help <clears throat> unloosen the mind from its programmed state to begin to activate liberation through through sacred creativity through the divine imagination and through these you know different art forms and also what you're speaking to with you know on the colors of your of your palette and um, doing that radical self-questioning, because I feel that's really key, and I'm right there with you on that. So I didn't, I mean, there's a question in there, or perhaps there's a, could you speak more to this line? Sure. I, I hear you. There, it's a very, <clears throat> from my humble opinion, very beautifully articulated edge that we're on. I feel that some of us are on and I don't put myself <clears throat> in an elite position. Um, but I will say that, <clears throat> you know, looping back to around to my own sacred country of Myanmar, my <clears throat> birth of my Dharma life, they were forced to integrate crystal. These, these concepts that I'm bringing forth in their own language into society because as you know i've spoken about but often overlooked <clears throat> you know wherever the white man and woman went out of england pretty much they did so with the decimation of indigenous populations and mass murder or both to state the obvious canada australia america perfect examples but burma was another great example of that an occupying nation out of britain for 125 years from 18 21 until 1948. And that was done at the behest of Winston Churchill's father, who was the governor general of India in 1820, 25 or so, and decided to pluck Burma and give it to the queen and did so at the expense of 15 million indigenous people, <clears throat> systematically oppressed them, decimated them and, and forcibly humbled them to be acquiescing to the white man's imperialism and genocide. And I've studied it very much in detail. I've been to the museums in England. I've spoke the language in Burma. I've been around the country hundreds of times. I know it inside and out. I'm not a historian, but I'm pretty aware. And people often overlook Burma's dictatorship or series of dictatorials. This, I'm going to loop back to what you're saying. Series of dictatorships from post 47, 48 up until the present to be the result of their, you know, diseased culture their inability to manifest democracy, their shaming of in, in ancestral wisdom. It's 135 ethnicities in Burma, 135 different languages in a country of 50 million people, the size of Germany or France or Texas. It's a diversity. Burma isn't just a nation. It's a diverse microcosm of the planet. Atheism, Muslim, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Catholicism, and Buddhism. 
And it happens to be the home in modern times of the mindfulness intelligent movement. And it's ironic to me that no one has spoken out about the genocide in Burma, especially Buddhist teachers. And it's fascinating to me, the collective vilification of the people, including Aung San Suu Kyi, by many of the Buddhist elites in the world based upon propaganda. So it's like, whoa, my own country, led by a radical woman who empowers the divine feminine in a nonviolent revolution, brought mindful intelligence, Dharma intelligence, and meditation to the forefront of democracy and art, Crystal. Some of the greatest activists in Burma are the artists, the satirists, the musicians. Right now, it's being led by Gen X, and a lot of them are really into rad, Burmese-oriented hip-hop music. They refuse to be cowered by Big Brother. And many of you know that George Orwell lived in Burma, the seeds of 1984, and he had blood on his hands, by the way. He was part of the military oppressive unit of the country. And yeah, you can speak about Big Brother being one of the Big Brothers. He doesn't account for that. And it's very interesting to me to see Burma as this microcosm of, whoa, they disrupted the status quo where traditional modalities no longer worked. The monks and nuns aren't leading the revolution in Burma. It's the lay women. It's a matriarchal revolution. And not just the embodied woman, but the embodied principles crystal of the feminine. And I've been a translator of this now for 40 years. This is not like me overlaying Westernism on Burma. And so we, we have, my point is, we have a long-standing example. I'm not saying that Burma is the only culture for that. Tibet has its version. Canada has its version. But Burma is 38 years of active, feminine-inspired, nonviolent revolution to confront toxic, primarily white male dominated capitalistic oppressive forms of culture upon an indigenous population, Burma. And so by default is my point, I've been studied mindfulness and meditation in Burma, but a deep immersion in the politics of revolutionary art as vocation to transform society. And so all of a sudden it's looping right back to my own country. 25 years ago, I broke out of the cult of being a teacher and took to the stage. The first show was at the East Van Cultural Center in 2003. Why did I do that? I chose not to do the same show twice because freedom was more important than conformity to make people laugh. But I had 25 more times people coming to the stage than I did to my retreats because I was an artist speaking my mind rather than rehearsed well-articulated dharma talks this is coming right back to your point what to do with this new edge obviously i'm stating the obvious you're an artist and a woman a writer a thinker a revolutionary what do i do the inclination is to rally the masses but i think the harder thing is for me is to do your own rallying to take risks in your own daily hour to hour existence, to break yourself as much as possible out of the box of collusion and conformity to small mindedness. And how can I play big with often less money, less popularity? What is art that's more radical that I'm capable of bringing forth? I would much prefer to be touched and loved and dance and eroticized, but I'm taking a big breather from all of what big medical pharma told me, Alan, you're dying. If you don't get surgery, you're dead. You better get your will in place, get, get your plot of land. You better take these drugs to ward off your depression that you're in denial of. And I said, fuck off, dude. 
I broke out of that. Here I am eight months down the road. Now that I've overcome the cult of dying, it's like, now what? And this is why I attribute Jillian, Richard, Dana, others at the Sentinel, friends of mine here and around the world. I'm coming back out. Uninhibited truth telling, which isn't about you are wrong. It's just pointing out without blame as much as humanly possible, a new paradigm because you're feeling a new edge of wanting to use the vocation of your hands, your body, your voice, because you care as a parent about your daughter's future and the children of the future. When I think about what I love the most, Crystal, it wasn't, you know, when I was a kid, I survived on music. Fuck people who vilify American culture as toxic. Buzz off, dude. It gave us radical music. It gave us the civil rights movement. It gave up the courage to be different, Mrs. Rosa Parks. I refused to sit at the front of the bus of my conformity. And it gave us Hendrix. It gave us great singers. It gave us the chance to use our voice. Freedom of speech isn't just using your voice, it's using your music. And so I ask people, what are you doing that you really wish you could do if you had a magic wand? I'd like to, what? Write it down on the colors of your palette. What's your creative expression formations? I love theater. I love getting on a stage and using my voice and my body to encourage the greatest kept secret on the planet peaceful, sacred reciprocity of coexistence. Who wouldn't want to dance rather than kill? I think it's just a very ancient habit of the human psyche, perhaps of the DNA of this godless consciousness that we're embedded. And the way out, and I use this phrase over and over, I've coined psychedelic activism. Put it in the mouths of your own mouth. Break the conformity of your own inner struggle to belong. Overcome your need to overcome your trauma, your anxiety, your depression. Consider them as good news, as superpowers. And hey, if you got one hour left on earth, one day, what are you going to do with it? What are I mean, really play high stakes like the boys and girls in Gaza, Israel, and Burma right now. They play high stakes. When they go out, on their little missions, they know they're gonna be killed. What are you gonna do with the hour, the two, the day? But if you're going out as an artist, how many pages I ripped up of incredibly articulate, Allen-esque, yet again, another nuance about the psyche in context. Bullshit, Alan. Say the unthinkable, what is it? Be clumsy, be awkward, be a misfit of your own articulation. And these are some of the things I'm documenting that are going to be very much fundamental to the retreat in August. And if you're interested in the interface of Dharma, mindful intelligence, and art, creativity, expression, breaking, I'm really good at breaking, helping people break from the conformity of their own adapted adaptation to belonging. How many people are struggling in their depression because they don't really like their work? And it's not just re-envisioning the work to be more mindful of it. So you can go to a luxury retreat at the end of the year and pay $5,000 to refit again into conformity. It's like, how can I live my life as an artist, rather than a spiritual practitioner. That's so two days ago. So the interface of aesthetics, bear with my rant here. You know, back in 2000, 1980, 88, 87, I don't know about you, but I have, you ever had shame? I know it sounds ridiculous to even ask that, but 
the shame in which we fantasize about being touched, love, eroticized, the shame of our Look in the mirror of your own mind and do you, do you like the shape of your nose? Do you like the shape of your teeth? Do you like the shape of your nipples, your yoni, your penis, your waist? How easy it is to camouflage that shame with clothing and with makeup and with spiritual platitudes and with healing. But have you really felt the beauty of your shame as instigator of not just acceptance, but wearing it as a badge of honor you're a warrior of existential war mom and dad had mom and dads and mom and dads and mom and dads all of whom were assholes and good people what's the art of gratitude to empower the art of the scars my point and so i had shame around my car accident when i was 15 years old drunk out of my mind being displaced by the war in Vietnam with military parents and a brother who was ready to go get killed, where every day of my life was graded upon being eventually draft age where I'd go kill. So I was drunk out of my mind at 15 and a half, hit a telephone pole, nearly killed my best friend and went through the windshield. 600 stitches later, brain trauma, blah, blah, blah. I always saw these scars as being a testament to being ugly that I overcame with articulation, with sexuality, with drugs, with morphine, with opioids, with masturbation, on and on. And I don't say there were compensations, but I never could really feel the shame that I felt impacted in my behavior. So on MDMA therapy, about three years in, I opened up to these scars. And my friend said, Alan, Alan, I've seen those scars since we've been friends for years, man. I know how you got them, but I don't see them as scars. But they, they show to me character that you were able to fucking take whatever you dealt with to another level of courage. And I did never anyone talk to me that way. I said, what do you, what do you mean? I, said, I, I just want to get rid of them, Bob. They're just, I've got to get cosmetic surgery. I need filler. I need Botox. I need larger breasts, less breasts, longer penis. I need to do it differently. I need to get it made over. Said, All right, I'll take you to the best cosmetic surgeon in Beverly Hills. We went, put me under these microscope glasses they're looking at my scars putting my forehead back talking to me how i got them and they said you may not like this but we'll just have to wait for him to come back again <laughs> Okay, it's, it's, it's just Bali, so bear with me. Anyway, I'm getting carried away with this story, Crystal. And so, anyway, this, this cosmetic surgeon encouraged me to inhabit them with grace, dignity, courage, 
and beauty. Never had anyone talk to me about that. Not overcome my shame, but just displace it with a more immediate state of consciousness. And that gave me a lot of liberty to access my untapped creativity. And I moved away from the spiritual world into the Dharma world of creativity and art and saw that that personal aesthetics and creative uniqueness were very instrumental to my forward movement in the world of Dharma. And so I'm right back to, as Aung San Suu Kyi encouraged me, which is our revolution will be successful if each of us empower one person at a time, primarily yourself. Take it off others is a very important mantra. Take your story off others. Leave it on the stage. Leave nothing behind in the ring. Leave nothing behind on the field. Nothing. Take it off other. Reclaim self-responsibility as the grace of art. Learn your art. Uninhibited art. It doesn't mean that you're not aware of your influence and impact on other. But that's a very different thing than doing it for other. You're not an entertainer with your art, with your literature. I'm a real believer that some of the best art, some of the best music is that this person on stage, they fucking believe that. They, they believed that music. That's why I'm a real believer in self-therapy. It's a cliched term, but it's like, and now take it out of the clinician's office. Take it off of the next Wednesday at $200 an hour thing. You are your teacher. You are your guru. You are your artist. And it's right there. It's immediate. But it's an overlooked process because of the commodification of our culture, the unrecognized collusion with toxic capitalism that's inhabited the psychological, the spiritual, and the psychedelic, and the meditative. It's, a, it's like 7-Eleven retreats today. And the same thing with psychedelics. Yet again, another psychedelics assisted training for a month, a year, or three, or a lifetime, or six. Yet again, yet again, all about loot. What about helping the individual to be their own shaman, their own teacher, their own guru, their own lover? This is, I think it's going to catch on. But psychedelic assisted activism and psychedelic self assisted self therapy will be the new paradigm because it's not only cheaper, it's more efficacious because you know yourself far better than anyone else in the world. Sorry, push over girls and guys. You don't need to be trained. You need to train yourself. And it's right there. Meditation is self therapy, Buddhist psychology is self therapy. It's not dependency on the teacher as the psychedelic dharma assisted training. Training in self responsibility, not in obedience to the authority. There's no such thing as healing in Buddhism. There's no original wound in Buddhism. Those are all misplaced delusions, culturally sanctioned illusions. And I'm not denigrating them. I have a phrase that I use for myself, infinite gradations of everything. But self, self-responsibility is the heart of the artist, I find, the good artist, the poet that's willing to not be seen or understood or recognized. So that's a little bit of my riff on that topic. I can go into it more, but we'll open it up to other questions if you have them. And please feel very free to state whatever it is that's important. And uh, let's dive into that if you want. Dana, is any other questions that might be important? Or a topic within the topic? Well, yeah. I actually have a question. Oh, great. Oh, Gordon, Gordon, you can go ahead. Yeah, well, well I, I was actually curious if you could bring forth um, an example 
of what you were you were sharing these states of mind and to inhabit and um to acquaint ourselves with and i i would i'm i'm like asking for an example of like going into one of those and what that what that experience is like for you so you know you had integrity and acceptance and authenticity and self respect well, it's like i hear you it's it's like dana you and i are talking right now and it's like asking what's motivated in those words mm -hmm. You and I are both speaking in English, and how did we learn that English vocabulary? Mm -hmm. We were taught phonetics and syntax and enunciation, and we inhabited those ideas to the point where they became natural elements of an unrecognizable inner motivation and skill set that, for the most part, remains invisible. Mm -hmm. Meditation and Buddhist-oriented psychology is the systematic training of how you learn the vocabulary of states of consciousness to the point where you become more and more natural to these invisible enunciations that grace of God and goddess gave us the capacity of lungs and oxygen and a larynx and a brain to intersect with the radiance of language, without language, imagine us being mute. But without the language of consciousness and the articulation of states of consciousness, look what we are as a species, as a planetary race. Look at, look at war, look at rape, look at denigration, look at inequality, all from states of consciousness. And we can't, where are they? But they're everywhere if we had the learning on how to know them. Eastern philosophy gave us the art of meditation, but meditation is an overriding concept, not easily understood, unless I say this with respect, been blessed with the unusual teachers, primarily in Buddhist tradition, who employed the power of satipatthana and mindful intelligence because those are the necessary of the invisible SOMs. They teach you how to cognitively feel the vibrational frequency that's inherent in states of mind. They're frequencies, Dana. And on psychedelics, when you're sensitive, you can go, Whoa, what precedes these words is the intention. And the intention is dipped in either habit or a deliberate occupation of an SOM. And those adepts, so to speak, are men and women who know their minds sufficiently to say what I am coming from, they know to be true. It's authentic. It's got integrity. The Dalai Lama is empowered around the world to be a man of integrity. He knows the mind of compassion and kindness, so they say. Emotional intelligence points to the state of mind called adaptation, suitability, resilience. These are invisible states of mind that require the art of learning how to occupy where is resilience in my own mind where is patience you're a mother you've had to inhabit patience but it's not always easy to know where it is in a given moment being an adept is knowing i have access to it when i need it look at martial arts i'm not a martial artist but look at the practice inherent needed to know how to put that into immediate action you are trained. An opera singer, the range of voice, trained. A meditator in some of these ancient cultures that have access to courage not to violate when being violated, but to use your voice and your patience and your creativity, trained in states of mind. And so this is why we're going to do the retreat at the Sentinel 
it's going to be, you'll see hands-on if you're there, which I hope you are, how to occupy a state and know that state rightly rather than a mind that's considered it wrongly or is often a habit. You'll see how hard it is to control your mind when you just simply ask, sit there and watch your breath for 30 minutes and 27 minutes of those 30 minutes, most people cannot do that. They have no ability to put the brush of their own mind in the state of mind. Something as simple as embodied presence? Bullshit. A meditator knows how hard it is to be mindfully embodied. So that's the practice of inhabiting. It's not invisible in the real sense. It's so tangible on a psychedelic or with someone who's very conversant with these states and then you know whoa this person's an artist of her mind she wears it with tremendous composure nuance and grace it's hard to see those kind of people unless you're on often a meditative state or a psychedelic and even then it requires pointing out sometimes who you're with how many arrogant western teachers i saw come to the monastery and assume that they knew so much more than the teachers they were with. It was tragically painful to watch that. They didn't know the art or the state of mind called humility. And teachers, they were very patient. We're not asking you to pay. We don't need your applause. They didn't even ring the bell, but they never, never responded to their questions again. And they gave them the art of being in their own process. They called it, let them cook in their own oil. They're not being rewarded for their projection. You didn't come here to tell me what I don't see in myself. Okay, thank you. And they would often joke indirectly. You're like a soap seller that doesn't use your own product. You know, what an insult that is, huh? So invisible is the new visibility, but you need clearly qualities of mind on your palate that can see the invisible you know the story of shakespeare and king lear gloucester and king lear blind and king lear asks how is it that you see gloucester he said to the king i see quote feelingly that's mindfulness that's mindful intelligence People know who can see with their eyes wide open what people normally can't see. Shakespeare brought forth in this particular great piece of art, the art of seeing feelingly. But feelingly isn't just somatic. I've coined the term cognitive somatics. It's another euphemism, it's another synonym for mindful intelligence. And I would encourage people to use that word, not just somatics of physical sensations, but cognitive somatics, the mindful intelligence of inhabiting a state of mind. That's the new edge I find that it's in culture right now. And so thank you for your question. But the retreat is all built, Dana, upon cognitive somatics. That's the centerpiece of world dharma, the centerpiece of mindful intelligence. Other questions or things that might be important? I enjoy this last 30 minutes before we go into 2024 August. Again, to those of you who are there and participating, uh, it's purposely a very small gathering, which isn't small, 14 people. I want it to be a unique process that we're offering it by application. We're not going to take everyone. You have to be suitable. There'll be Zoom sessions to talk with Dana and others and myself about the suitability of it. It'll be filmed as a prototype to be offered freely to the world later on. And there'll be mindful intelligence, meditation, and those who voluntarily want to experiment with the psychedelic, that'll be offered there. I personally will not be using it. 
I want to be completely natural in the state, but I'm very conversant with the use of it. And the people there who will be holding space, including Dana, are extremely proficient and professionals in long time holding of space, especially for those who are micro or small dosing of psilocybin and other substances. So that'll be offered optionally. Also, it's another element of deep nature, deep nature. I walk in deep nature three to five miles a day. I utilize the power of natural sunlight. I'm on a very, very simple diet, no alcohol, no caffeine, no sugar, no ice cream, no desserts, nothing wrong with them, but I'm sensitizing to a coming forth and trying the best I can to, I use the word sparingly, to pr do practices my teacher encouraged me to do for Dhamma healing. I'm choosing not to just live with a prognosis that seems to be terminal, but I'm trying to create a miracle inside through consciousness. And I've been well-versed by my teachers in how to go about that. And so I'm using this time here to be in sacred Dhamma healing retreat. And part of that is, is high artistic manifestation, books, film, albums, thinking, creativity. And so that's a little bit of my personal process. And all of this is going to be coming forth in the retreat in August, which is going to be put up, by the way, in the next couple of weeks, where there'll be an application on the Sentinel website and my own website for those who want to participate. You can apply. We'll talk to you very quickly. And we'll probably, by January or February, decide on who those 14 people will be. There's already been a number of people who sent in their emails. And if you're listening and you're interested, send Dana personally an email that I'm interested with your ways of contact. And we'll get back to you when the application is up online. And the explanation of the retreat is well presented on the Sentinel's website. Gary, did you have a question? I see that you're unmuted. Yes, thank you. Hi, hi, um, uh, hi, Alan. This hi, is Gary. Um, yeah, I have a complex question. I need to uh, frame it somewhat. Um, Take your time, I've please. Been, I've been uh, um, out of touch. You've been off my radar for a while, and then I, I haven't. Uh, caught that much of this uh, presentation on your videos. So um, I just wanted to tell you my thoughts on something and see how you resonate with it or, or if you have answers for my cool. question. Um, cool. uh, so I've been thinking about empire a lot and how uh, oh, we didn't really have a good word for what we were revolting against in the 60s. I was a, a teenager in the 60s, but I was in tune with the kind of revolution that was happening in the culture. And uh, we called it, you know, the establishment and the man was keeping us down. But I think the the word we, we didn't use much was empire. And I still don't hear that word used very much, although we live immersed in empire. And uh, Philip K. Dick said, a science fiction writer said, the empire never ended. And I, I take that to mean that the, uh, from the Sumerians to the Romans who really perfected empire through the British empire and now the US empire and the, Chi the Chinese empire that uh, we all are uh, to some extent or almost all of us are prisoners of empire and we grow up and we live and breathe in empire. And um, so the problem with fighting empire, and, and I think this is something we learned in the 60s, is that you kind of make the empire more real and, more, and stronger when you fight against it. It becomes an us and them situation. So uh, to fight empire at any level seems to strengthen the empire 
And also there's um, a nested empire. Uh, so it's not just uh, an outside thing. It's integrated into your life in so many ways. And, and you've got, um, at least I have, you know, I'm retired now. So I got away from that part of empire but I've got a house uh, on, on an acre of land because we wanted to, to some extent, grow our own food. And it's kind of like this little nested empire that I'm in that I, that I have to maintain in it. It's, um, there's a price to be paid for that, for having this, this little piece of land and this house and, and everything that I own. And um, so that is also immersed, you know, it, it imprisons me in some ways. And, and so uh, the most inner part of empire is the, is the dream of empire. It's the collective dream and archetype that, that we carry within us. And I think, I think of it in terms of addiction now. I think I'm, a, I'm addicted somewhat to to um, you know, to the stories of Empire, to getting my information from Empire and from from Netflix and from Prime and Amazon Prime and 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 um, so we're attached in so many ways that it's uh, just uh, it's difficult to deal with the even the internal, the most inner part of Empire, which I think we we have to um deal with before we can have an influence on the outer empire so i see it kind of as a a double bind catch 22 situation because um i i'm usually failing in my attempts to to overcome this addiction and it's it's a very powerful and and most of it deeply unconscious addiction to empire and then to, to fight it on the outside would just be foolish to me because it's still on the inside. So I, that's how I see it as a double bind. And, um, and, and, and so I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Thank you for sharing, Gary. And I, I deeply empathize with your articulation as I hear it of, an existential complexity that's inherent seemingly in the texture of this totality that the Buddhists call samsara. I think what, if I were to just, and I will be in integrity to how I'm hearing you and share my interiority rather than answer anything, and please excuse if it doesn't touch anything in you, but I don't know how else to respond except how I'm thinking to myself and let you overhear that is you know, one of the most compelling concepts that attracted me to, and I use this word carefully, experiential based Dhamma, not Buddhism. Dhamma is the operative concept within Buddhist teaching, Dhamma. The felt experiential lawfulness of reality. This this matrix, this texture, this ecosystem, this this architecture that we're embedded in, life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the right, the wrong, the, the truth, the, the lies, the empire, the slavery, the projections, the dimensionality, the quantum physics, the psychedelic stratas, life before planet Earth, life after planet Earth. We all know from just studying basic astronomy and that our mother sun that keeps our food developing it keeps the oceans where it is it keeps a suntan it keeps light we can see in this photonic bubble of seven miles high without it without photon without there's no seeing how deeply embedded we are to be a creature of senses that sees based upon light based upon a completely a nietzsche impermanent sun star one of infinite numbers in a galaxy of an infinite dimensions of a cosmos so to state the obvious whoa what level of reality what spiritual battle do you want to fight what level of extinction do you want to overcome the one on planet earth the sixth one that we're in or what about the one that takes the entire earth so you might argue on an existential level it's a completely losing battle 
to place any emphasis on trying to confront empire within the texture of what the Buddhist calls samsara. And bear with me. The word samsara, without a study of the word samsara, you're lost. No offense to you, Gary, or anyone else. But I, I can't have a conversation with someone personally who doesn't have an appreciation for the meaning of samsara. And what does samsara mean? It means infinite gradations of of unoptional existence. <laughs> You're born into this world and have whatever belief system you want, whether you're an atheist or a non-believer in rebirth, but guess what? It doesn't take too much LSD or psilocybin or ayahuasca to realize, fuck, your little three pound brain hasn't figured it out. I don't care what level of enlightenment you've got. It's like, this is an overwhelming situation. And yes, American totalitarianism cloaked as democracy is bullshit. I could crow till the, the moon goes back under the oceans. And whenever is there going to be peace on earth through the crash of empire? Read the study of history. Convulsions of savagery and massacre interspersed with moments of childbirth and splendor and beauty. We all know it. Dance, music, intimacy, it's interspersed. My point here, Gary, is the word samsara carries and embraces dimensionality of experience. But it's not framed that there's a beginning to it or even an end to it in any way of eternal peace. It doesn't mean you give up the fight, but without a recognition of the influence of the word samsara, you often take the battle to an unwinnable front outside. It doesn't mean that you don't commit yourself to revolution, but I've never found a more powerful revolution than the ones out of Burma with a nonviolent, feminine inspired radiance of keeping your Dhamma alive. That's why they called it a revolution of the spirit, Gary. First and foremost, to be revolutionaries of taking so-called down the empire, call it dictatorship or totalitarianism or patriarchy. One must commit to the revolution of the spirit, meaning you must engage how to overcome your own fear, your own ignorance, your own anger. And then you are successful in your revolution. Take the outcome off of them coming down and you going up. And I can't emphasize that enough to people. I've been in the front lines and I say this very sparingly, I'm no hero. And my times in war zones have been brief from a three months to a couple of years, but I've studied the pathology of violence up close I've been friends who were monks in a monastery that gave up the robes to fight in war, in genocide, to overcome. I'd rather be murdered than to be murdered. My first book was Burma, the Next Killing Fields, to be in the front lines of a genocide. Yugoslavia for the final year of their three-way genocide, the pathology of violence. And it comes right back to it. It seems like a helpless thing to say, Gary, but I cannot emphasize enough for making and encouraging people make haste with your vocation of coming out of the and i say this sparingly of the addiction of overthrow and be surprised at creative expressions of artistic challenge and satirical comedic levels of artistic poetry and music. When you bring it home, take it off other. Let the system right now implode. Come home, take this tragic as it is to be your moment of Anne Frank. That's my motto. Go inside and 
create your own self-therapeutic diary on how you can inhabit your own mind, your family, your garden, your house, if you're blessed. And it's not easy. It's over my head to have a garden or a house. It's too much work. I don't have it. I'm dependent on the Balinese who do the gardening here and the food, and I praise them. But I am making haste with my inner art, my inner dharma, my inner mindfulness. Meditate more. Be more creative, more self-reflective. If you're blessed to be in a relationship and you have your sister, your brother, your family, your mother, your daughter, your lover near you, make them goddesses and gods of communion and giving. Create a sacred context of awakening in your home. Be your best friends together. Learn the art of radical, creative, sensual, erotic presence together. Reinvent love and beauty. Be radiant expressions in that home of Diary of Anne Frank. I can't imagine the elegance of their emotions under the stress of that level of pressure. I've seen political prisoners who've been released to tell me how often their communication in a prison cell with six or eight of them stuffed when only three could live. How they often thought about how much more precious their time was in a prison cell because of the communication and the communion that their revolution had to be one of conscience and dignity and the application of creative presence with their own prisoners. These are my examples, Gary, of taking it off other and coming home. And I know it sounds a little bit contradictory, but I am not inclined to be at the front lines of combat. I'm not a kamikaze. I, best I could do would be a non-gun carrying independent journalist in war zones. And believe me, I was no, I was kept alive by people who were combatants. It's not my vocation to be up close. It's a tragic beauty to have had the experience. But man, unless you're willing to really fight at the front lines today, the war, look what's going down in Israel and Gaza. It's an out of control madness on both sides and around the world. People are talking about it in the abyss of a third world war. It's like, what? Who's leaving listening to us? Use your voice. But I say 98% of your heart, come home, get your meditation cushion out, get your yoga mat out, get your food out. I eat alone now because you know why? I stopped even listening to music or writing or watching the news. I'm going right back into the occupation of my monasticism, my monkdom in society, mindfully slowing everything down, Gary. Just slow it down. I want to die in conscience and in peace. I want to live in conscience, in peace. And again, cognitive somatics. May that meme go around the world. Psychedelic activism. And I pause here, Gary. I'm going to talk about it more and more. I even got a book coming out called Psychedelic Activism, in which enough white middle class, upper middle class dosing to overcome your anxiety. Give that damn psychedelic to the leaders. People should take to the streets. Do ayahuasca, Trudeau. Do come to the Sentinel, Biden. We'll give you a freebie. Bring Dr. Jill and all of the Congress and the Senate. Bring Lindsey Graham. Bring Klaus Schwab. Bring Putin. Bring Xi Jinping. You can all come to the Sentinel and do a small dose of psilocybin and being held in grace so you can purge your toxic denial of violence over love. How simple is that? How come we're not on the streets? How come... Jordan Peterson is in shouting, psychedelic activism, Trudeau, open your mouth, Biden, open your mind, call off the war in Gaza, in Israel, in the Middle East, 
do a psychedelic. It transforms little old us. Why wouldn't it transform them to be better politicians? Not to overcome your fucking pathology. To be a better leader, Mr. Trudeau. Really? I can be a better leader with some psilocybin? Yep. How do you do that? Just come to the Sentinel. We'll pay your way. Bring your private jet. And stay for a week. And dose up throughout the day. Swim. Be massaged. Love. Cry. Call off your leadership. And take a little bit more of a higher dose. And do self therapy. And if you need some support, Mr. Clements will come there and be your psychiatric support. Okay, I'll, I'll do it for free. Why is that radical? Why isn't that on international television tonight on CNN or on CBC? Beaming in from Bali, Mr. Clements, a radical human rights activist, psychedelic activism for Trudeau and Biden to call off the war in the Middle East, come to the Sentinel. Why is that scene as radical? It's funny, but it's like high art, Gary. When I first did acid about a year before Jimi Hendrix came out onto the scene, and I did some acid one night and I walked into a party and I heard Hendrix for the first time and there was something in the psychedelic mixed with that music that just know what it turned me on to? It wasn't Jimi. An untapped creativity of freedom in myself. And so I say this very lightly. If you want to experiment with the possibility of seeing what you don't see, meditation is a sure guarantee if you got the right guide to support you. But not many of the right guides are out there today. Burma's closed. I don't recommend going to retreats, except mine. 14 people, psychedelic. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm actually a repressed DJ, I'm a repressed artist, I'm a repressed, call it a revolutionary worker, not a sex worker, I'm a revolutionary worker. I didn't know that, I didn't know to overcome my trauma. I don't need to be an expert, a teacher, a therapist. I need to be an artist of my heart and go, wow, I've got music in my conscience, music in my soul, and guess what? I'm gonna be not a yoga teacher, I'm gonna empower myself to do that asana in defiance of what Iyengar and Ashtanga told us to do it like. Radical authenticity is the portal into cognitive somatics. Uniqueness is the missing thing. So empire is the absence of imagination, Gary. And we need to instill how to bring wonderment and imagination and creative expression to the stage of the world. Artists are the ones who are going to revolutionize empire. I don't think it's going to be done with the gun or the missile or even the protests at this point. I bless their heart. In Burma, it's the artists who use their mind, their voice, and their body. And that's, I employ you, not just meditate, untap creativity. And if you need support, take your clothes off, except your Lululemon yoga shorts or your boxing shorts. Take a small dose of psilocybin. You can mail it in and get some really interesting music that gets you into an uninhibited flow of your body sensations. Break a little bit of the conformity of living in a coffin called normalcy. That's what I do, and I've been doing it for years, and it's like, whoa. Then the biggest problem is you can't find anyone to dance with unless you're open to the serendipity of magic. But start with your own. That's the key here is, where's my magic? So that's a little, little bit of my rave, Gary. And the conversation, we could go on about it. I so honor what you're saying. It's so complex and it's not easy to have people in our lives close to us that inspire the unorthodox creativity of our own uniqueness. You know, keeping that innocent, beautiful. Yes, we've been hurt, but they're not scars that we should be ashamed of. 
And the best way to inhabit the scar, because I can't get rid of my scars, but I can certainly change the attitude. And I don't know about you, but I've made a lot of so-called cultural, psychological, emotional mistakes, primarily based upon unrecognized ego, blindness, pride, self-deception, which is natural. But is there a trail? I've been pretty cool to catch myself. I abandoned teaching when I began to see that the luxury and the beauty of a double life far exceeded my enlightenment. Why did I like sex and masturbation and eroticism and drugs more than I did teaching meditation? I think you're a little bit out of sync with what you're doing. It's not, it's, now it's a livelihood. Well, just drop that and create a new livelihood where you can be truly authentic in what you do and you align with the way you live and the way you think. Well, I never thought of that, alignment. Better to live like a fraud and be paid for it. Again, this is satire, but I like satire. So, other questions before we end, and or shall we call it call a halt on this today and leave the rest of it for August 2024? I remind you, reach out to Dana at the Sentinel. You have her email, and just simply, if you're interested, put your name on the list. We're going to present it. There'll be an application. And I don't know who the people are, but we're going to present it to the world. And for me, it's a gift. It's given me hope on the horizon of my future. And I want to film it so that I can offer it online because my country of Burma is closed as a prototype, not to follow me, but to overhear how we do it so you can take the videos if you want and bring them to your own region of the world and create your own mini retreat in nature with your own tribe of three to five people and stop paying high prices, no offense to that, to go to those luxury places with those real experts to learn from them when you can do it right at home for free with your own tribe, with your own legalized, soon to be legalized psychedelic if you want and go, whoa. And just an augment to these other elite retreats, which has certainly outpriced me and my friends, except for the Sentinel. They offer things that are very unique and there are very few people that do that. Burma offered retreats on Dana. The culture supported free offerings to allow people from all sectors of society to come to inhabit cognitive somatics, which is another term for mindfulness practice it's not buddhism i'm not i'm not a buddhist by the way if you're interested not a buddhist and this retreat is not about buddhism not into that i'm into dhamma and things that i've learned from many systems i call it world dharma and our teachers are ourselves our fingerprints are unique and each of us have a different dharma path and Dhamma is a kind of lawfulness. And this is the lawfulness of the system of transformation. That's, I just can't shake the word Dhamma from my mind, and I don't want to. But you've got to be very careful of inhabiting the dogma of Dharma and become overly burdened by the religiosity and the commitment unrecognized, which is collusion for orthodoxy. Very, very tender edge that we're going to explore in the retreat as well. So, Dana, should we end now? Um, yeah, I mean, Alan, if, uh, if does anybody else have any any topics? Or take, any your, take your time. I'm just going yeah. just going back to dosing and meditation and here. Yeah, we no still have problem. another 21 minutes. So, oh, we do. Okay, cool. Yeah, we do. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Yeah. And hi. anyone who, Gordon, please take your time. Oh, hi. Thank you. We, we were in such a conundrum. We were to turn our video on, we'd have to quit the program. And we, we were just so spellbound and, and grateful for your, um, what you've, what you've uh, shared tonight. Um, I didn't want to quit the, uh, the zoom to put the video on. So this, I hope this doesn't seem uh, antisocial. Um, so um, very interested in the retreat. Uh, again, wonderful teaching. Wondering in the time that you have, 
Um, if you wanted, to, if you were able to uh, comment a little bit more about the near future of psychedelics, um, you know, I'm I, I, I'm interested in um, you know what you said about mindfulness. It was just really profound. Um, you know, microdosing could be the new mindfulness. It's performance enhancing. It's amoral. It can be. Um, and you know, uh, my partner and I, Natalie, uh, you know, we're 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 getting further into the field, and and yet, you know, it's it's uh, it's becoming a more complicated place, and and yet more people are coming to it. So maybe as you're as you're recommending that some of our some of our leaders should uh, perhaps dose or dose more. Um, <laughs> So maybe maybe there's something in that 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 uh, you know the, the the thought that psychedelics makes people nicer and more ethical. Um, anyways, any any thoughts you had about the near future of psychedelics would be welcome, and thank you again. You're very welcome, Gordon. Um, I I tend to I I intend to speak more truthfully about my personal research over the 40, 50 years of psychedelic use in my life from probably well over 100 LSD trips before I was 21, I'm 72, till eventually my turn towards the more organic investigation of psyche, substratum, and consciousness through mindful intelligence and meditation. I got into meditation because I got tired of coming down from the psychedelic. Mm. And I wanted an organic, natural approach to the investigation of psyche. And I used the word substratum and of recognizable conscious reality, those three dimensions. And I wanted to not study Buddhism, but teachers who empowered direct felt experiential mindful intelligence in immediate present time reality. Call it the now. But the now is a, ve a way too limited understanding of, of how meditation works. It's not about being present alone. It's navigating consciousness with a discernible outcome without an attachment to that outcome. But you don't just take a, a, a boat across the ocean. You, you have a destination. Mm. You know? So meditation is the art of navigation, not being present. Mm. And the psychedelic, Gordon, it's, and I share with you a very personal observation. <clears throat> Post-monastic life, I got very actively in the 80s, and I was introduced. I lived, I was a neighbor with, um, uh, you might know the gentleman. I don't know which country you're in, but uh, John Perry, he was a psychiatrist. He was the, after Carl Jung had passed away in Zurich, became the president of the Jung Institute, John Perry. Then he came to America in, lived in Larkspur Canyon, where I lived. I came after him, obviously, when I left the monastery, and I had a home two doors down from him in the canyon. Hmm. And he became a mentor of mine in the study of madness, which he was most known for. And like the psychiatrist Artie Lang, who coined the term Insanity is a sane response to an insane world. John was a forefather of that concept. That, that madness is often an incredibly elegant response to the insanity of culture. It's not a new concept. But you've got to be very careful with the word culture, because there's also the word conditioning about culture. So John was a mentor and he had a soiree every two weeks, Gordon, in which uh, Terrence McKenna came, who was a friend of mine, uh, Alexander Schlogan, the so-called the father of MDMA. He was a neighbor and he came frequently, a friend. And I got actively involved in um, MDMA psychotherapy in the 80s. 
and for five years did that. And every session that I did was taped. Still have the tapes. It's been transcribed into a book. It's not been published. And I did it often with one of my beloved friends who's passed away, John, Robert Chardoff, most known for being the producer of all the Rocky films. But he was a, he brought mindfulness to Hollywood. And I was one of the first people that led retreats at his mansion in Malibu in the 80s. And he brought, along with some of his colleagues, including Terrence, psychedelics. And so I was involved in the MDMA self-therapeutic research model in the 80s, then went in to another long period of abstinence. And then in early 2000, I got actively involved in the use of microdosing, which is not often used with DMT, 5-MeO, 5-DMT-MeO um, for several years in Vancouver, where my partner at the time, colleague and another friend, we did thought experiments for the better part of three years. We also recorded those three years of sessions, maybe well over a hundred trips on DMT and MEO. So all of my research has been self. Coupled with that, microdosing here in Bali for four years off and on where I lived in the eighties, psilocybin. More recently, the last three years, and I mentioned this early on, I'm not sure that you were in, I was given by my doctors in hospice ketamine, which I knew very little about. I never had done it. And so I was given nasal script. And the next thing I know, I was like, wow, how interesting. The very first nasal injection I did of that at my nostrils, I stopped drinking wine. I went, what in the fuck? I wasn't a drinker, but it was like, I've returned a couple of times, but I, I stopped again. The next thing you know, I'm not like, sugar sucks. And I began to think of the sirloin that I was eating. And I kept seeing the more microdosing of ketamine that I did. I kept seeing that this actually was an animal. I know this sounds really crazy, but I, can, I began to see the cow with its calf and the love that they shared. And I said, I'm eating you. And I couldn't do an indigenous story on it. Like you got to learn how to kill what you eat. It was like, I, I want nothing to do with something that sees me as animal that kills me mindfully and eats me for dinner. I don't want to be part of that paradigm. I want to think out of that box. And so the psychedelic Gordon went, whoa. Then I began to study more and more people. I met a woman in, in Vancouver who was very prominent in the ketamine field, beautiful mind, some of her colleagues, and I met other people, Jillian and Richard, old time friends of mine, very connected to the psychedelic work in Canada and around the world. And I began to ask more and more questions and listen to more and more thought leaders. And so it brings me into the psychedelic renaissance. And my research, Gordon, which I'm going to share at the retreat, in a little bit in these sessions, is I, I'm very, very sensitive to the good, the bad, and the ugly of the psychedelic. And it's not the psychedelic alone. I don't know who coined set and setting, but you damn well better be very careful with assuming that the psychedelic is going to heal anything in you. And I could go on and on about that. And I have taken meticulous research, Gary, both on film, on audio and written. And I've got a book coming out, Psychedelic Activism. On my self-research and with my few friends where we've experimented and filmed ourselves talking on it about, and I get into places that I would not want another person to get into without deep mindfulness intelligence training. And even so, and I'm not aware that it's the psychedelic or is it my inner setting of my proclivity towards esoteric Buddhist principles. And I was saying to Dana, who's that when we've been talking off camera, 
about this issue of neuroplasticity. I know you know that term, Gordon, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 especially with the psychedelic, but especially with ketamine, which stays the neuroplastic effect of it stays five, six, seven days longer than in your blood. In how you can so-called to use an AI term prompt plasticity is both brilliant and terrifying. Right. Hmm. Because you can go, I do micro amounts of the ketamine. I know it really well at this point. Super small amounts. And I get into prompting on specific states of mind. Gordon, bear with me. And I go, oh my fucking God. I go from zero to 10,000 feet altitude in one minute on a small amount that's a higher dose than a high dose of acid. And it's it's about set and setting and plasticity and the mindful, intelligent expansion of plasticity, even though it was prompted by a wise prompt, it takes you into a territory that isn't some kind of groovy religious experience. It's not a bad trip either. It's classical wisdom in the progress of insight in Buddhist meditation. And it's like you're seeing context in its reality that's naked. And the Buddhist first noble truth was one of seeing dukkha, which is suffering, the intrinsic stress of consciousness. This is not trauma. This is intrinsic stress hmm. that you can't control your mind no matter how adept you are. You've got to live with the reality of the context that you're embedded and you're going, fuck, man, this is intense insight. You, It's either enlightenment or a kind of internal existential trauma. Yeah. Hmm. And I, I, I'm going to talk about this at the retreat. This is one of the reasons I'm not going to be dosing there, but holding space in small amounts. But the plasticity, the deliberate engagement of plasticity, which is often thought of as some brilliant, beautiful thing, neural pathways and blah, 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 blah. Neural pathways into insight is an unexplored territory. And the Renaissance is rah, rah, rah on religious experience. And I listen to these people, no offense, but religious experience is a projection primarily of kind of homogenized Hinduism with Christian theology. <laughs> oneness unity blah 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 and i'm no offense to you but it's we're, the deal isn't about oneness it's the ability to discern how to be at two with things <laughs> discernment is far more important than belonging to the cult of oppression and thinking that you will talk about bypassing Existential bypassing, another term I've coined. This is way beyond spiritual bypassing. This is existential bypassing. And I have to say the Buddhists, the spiritual elite in the world, and the psychedelic Renaissance leaders, hyper existential bypassing. And I'm willing to be on any stage in the world, not debate, but to share my truth or my evidence and bring it on. Let's have a dialogue, Gordon. Let's not make each other right and wrong, but let's look at the attitudes the language that we're holding psyche substratum and consciousness so that's the short answer to what you're bringing up brilliant thank you brilliant and i'm passionate about these because i'm a student of consciousness i'm not saying that i have any great insight i people who know me uh, to state the obvious who isn't flawed but hey I'm intense. This is from the trauma of this fucking brain injury and so much amphetamine, so much modifinal, so much morphine, so much opioids, so much. I've OCD'd on meditation. <laughs> and also the elegant, beautiful trauma of being up close to men and women who are willing to kill in the name of truth. That's not an easy thing. And those who have been combatants know that. It's over the top. You can't, no matter what you're saying about 
let's have a conversation about the war in the Middle East. Unless you're in the fucking Middle East and you've been a war correspondent and you are been there and lived there and volunteered there, shut the fuck up. Take your suit off, take your money off and go there and volunteer to work for the United Nations in Gaza or Israel, the West Bank. And let's see what you say when you come out of that for a month. Put some skin in the game, girl. Talk from direct experience, not from the white comfort of an apartment in New York. <laughs> and that's that's the bullshit of the dialogue pretty much in the Western world about this incredible tragedy. But my teacher, New Pandita, and I've said it to a few friends, Alan, what's new? Right. This is samsara. Mm. Do you know how many people in our country have been imprisoned, executed, and killed? Have you not read your own books, Alan? What's new in your white privilege culture that you're making a big deal now? Yes, it's a big deal. You're paying attention more. But the truth is, rise up, Alan, in your Dhamma intelligence and take it higher. And if you want to do something, which I've been really encouraged by the few men and women in my life who really can hear me and see me, shut the fuck up, dude, and go serve. The best evidence of your discovery is to go volunteer in a refugee camp or an IDP camp or to be there as an independent witness, not a journalist, and see firsthand. I have to say this, this is no pride intended, but I've even thought of going into Gaza if I could get in, just for the experience of being able to feel and see a new dimension of emotionality that has exceeded me in my, my life. <laughs> to go to the West Bank, to go to Jerusalem, to go to Tel Aviv and just not be an observer, but to feel, not being an interloper or being someone who's there as on the backs of this tragedy, but to grow in Dhamma and skillfulness, right? Mm -hmm. If I were to say something to Mr. Trudeau and Biden right now and the presidents and prime ministers around the world, take off your goddamn suit and go volunteer in one of the hospitals that you say shouldn't be bombed. Go to Tel Aviv and think of the terror of the settlers and let's come back and talk after that at the United Nations and tell the assembly of civilized ambassadors what it feels like to be in that circumstance. And then the power of diplomacy, the power of fucking dialogue. There's no other activism right now than to fucking let's talk about it, diplomacy. Every side is wrong. Mm -hmm. And the voice of the woman now is needed more than ever. What does that mean? Put your hands up and say, stop fighting, kids. It's time for dinner and conversation. No TV tonight. We've got to talk about our differences. We're a family. The basis of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All democracies are built upon the, the blueprint of a three-page abuse document of 30 articles agreed upon in 1948 by Eleanor Roosevelt. The blueprint for sanity, the most abused document on the planet. That's, Gordon, the psychedelic renaissance, a study of the universal declaration of human rights, not religious experience. <laughs> That's my advice to myself and others. Psychedelic leaders, take off your uniform. Go take the opportunity to serve in refugee camps anywhere you feel moved and come back after that and see how that impacts who you are, how you think, how you behave, and how you operate. That's my advice to leaders around the world and to teachers. Stop being a pundit on the privilege of your prophet from a distance on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok, or you're influencing on how many followers you have listening to you on your podcast. Fucking go there and volunteer, then come back and webcam from Gaza or Israel. Burma. Don't vilify our people in Burma with their colluding with genocide and imprison my friend in Burma, the witch hunt of this century. Shame on you, right? And these are the kind of things that I would say on stage 
or if I lost it on a stage of a debate in Vancouver or San Diego or LA, I say, bring it on. Leaders around the world, bring people on stage who aren't into collusion with the Renaissance being all groovy. The Renaissance is best kept by the catalyst of the psychedelic. But that's not going to make you intelligent. It's going to make you possibly feel if you're not in collusion with your expert. Belonging to the belonging is one of the greatest forms of self-deception. And you don't want to displease your psychedelic assistant expert with not catharding and purging on the appropriateness of how I'm overcoming my trauma. Guess what? This trauma isn't as bad as I thought it was. I'm sorry. It's like, I want to be somewhat different than overcoming trauma. Alan, shut the fuck up. You don't really understand true trauma. I'm not making it wrong. I'm just using my voice to satirize my own edge of complicity with comfort and with the status quo of white privilege healing. Where is the outrage? Not the conversation. Sacred piss off. This is why I think psych psychedelic activism must catch on immediately. We must go to Ottawa and Washington with place cards that say Trudeau and Biden do psilocybin, yes. do ayahuasca. Don't stop the war. Stop the war in your own mind. What's wrong with that? Oh, I'll be canceled. I'll be censored. I'll lose clients. What does it mean? 10,000 people take to the streets of Washington. Come to the Sentinel. We'll pay for you. Drop acid, drop psilocybin, do DMT, do one session of MDMA assisted therapy with your best friend and live stream that from the White House so that we can bear witness oh. to your catharsis. <laughs> Don't give us a State of the Union address of bullshit, Biden. <laughs> so that's again, the short answer is like, listen, if you're not willing to be vilified, go to bed. <laughs> go to sleep and make money doing it and find popularity in other sleepwalkers. No offense, but whoa, how can I use the Renaissance to overcome my plagiarism, to overcome my inhabited collusion with denied toxic capitalism? How have I called off the search of my own transformation? How am I not using my own medicine? How am I just walking my unable talk to sell more books, to look at my ranks on Amazon without anyone watching? How many likes and swipes and views have I gotten without telling my next podcast of my expert truth? You're a commodity. You're an influencer by numbers. Take off your suit and I don't know. What's the next edge of your own personal transformation? I think it's coming down off the pulpit. I say the priests and the the Pope and even the Buddhist hierarchy should they talk about universal truth? Come out of the comfort of your temper of your temple. And hey, Pope Francis, demand that you go to Israel and Gaza tomorrow and put yourself in the firing line and say, my service as a humble servant of God is more important than my privilege in the Vatican. Then you're plausible. His Holiness, come down from Dharamsala and offer going to fucking Gaza or Israel and put your name there because you want to see firsthand the truth, not rely on CNN or Al Jazeera or the New York Times. That means that's radical, ethical, spiritual courage to me. I'll go with you. I'm in. Bring a, that to me is how intervention takes place. Anyway, that's thank you for the question, Gordon. And I, again, I kind of 
rarely lose it. They tell me if I do this, I'll die, but so be it. Thank you again. So good. So such an important dialogue that I think many people are having, not just here, but it's, I can, I can hear and I feel it. It's like, I do believe as Martin Luther King said, when it's dark out, we'll see the stars. I do believe in this, this attempted apocalypse that there's going to be some things that shine that go, Oh my God. So be watchful here of despair. But participate, but but allow ourselves, Gloucester like, to see feelingly because those stars may not be visible to the naked eye. Mm -hmm. Really, again, women are very sensitive to this. The sensitivity of the cognitive somatic lens of the near invisible. What is radical? creative ingenuity what's the word uh oh the art of epiphany that's another one that i feel that's so important that contradicts the word practice meditation one of the greatest overlooked aspects of the psychedelic and of meditation is the uniqueness of epiphany not the fitting into a projected paradigm of religious experience. And that requires radical nonconformity as an art form. And so rather than reacting against how to inhabit the nakedness of your own, which listening to the way in which you live, think, and dance in the mirror of your own mind at home in your sacred temple. Take the blindfolds off, take the music off, and do such a small amount, Gordon, of the psychedelic that you're able to move. You're able to talk to yourself. You're able to record yourself. You're able to be outside in nature and, and listen to the intelligence of a hummingbird, a butterfly. You can move. Don't just sit there in this paralyzed sense of thinking that hallucinations are going to liberate you got enough hallucination already called the hallucination of conformity called self-deception called normalcy so the low dose is not a small it's a portal to the epiphany because you want the evidence when you come out this was me this wasn't a substance that's very crucial for me just enough so that you take the substance story off the experience. So microdosing as a cult is clearly a cult right now, no offense, but m dosing, the evidence of the intelligence of dosing for me is in the absence of its use, not in the frequency of its use. Mm -hmm. Very crucial point. The, the success of meditation is in the absence of the retreat, not in yet another retreat. My teachers in Burma called it the cult of the meditator. Mm -hmm. You don't hear Westerners talk about that, but that's a term that he coined. The cult of meditation was a Western concept because it's a commodified form of a beginning, middle, and end to do it again. And the more you do of it, the more likely you are to go deep. You can't get into a teacher training unless you've done 20 10-day retreats and three to six three-month retreats. In Burma, that's laughable. You don't meditate because you do it over and over and over again. You do it to inhabit the wisdom of it. And often the best kept secret is the best place to discover wisdom is in living, not in retreating. Non-dosing rather than dosing. And I don't know who was it, Gary, that used the word addiction to confront empire. The addiction of the psychedelic is so inculcated right now. They call it a renaissance. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. And I've seen people say ketamine's addictive. And I have to be very careful 
can I stop? Stop. Do I miss it? No. Because it's been more and more the mindful use of it while I use it to overcome that. And I've got really terrible oral fixation habits. The same thing with psilocybin. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Absence is wisdom. And again, coming back to the concept, what does the word epiphany mean to you? It means spontaneous, miraculous, life potentially transforming insight about you in context to the ones, your beloveds. The evidence of your wisdom is how well do you live and give and feel in the essence and the intimacy of those few people that are gifting you their bodies, their time, their presence, their vulnerability. I, I close here, and this is a very new area for me, which we're going to bring up in the retreat. And I haven't been able to formulate it right now is the word reconciliation. And I know it's a popular concept, but I feel personally, I don't know about you, it's one of the most bypassed concepts because almost everyone I talk to off record has legitimate people in their life that they don't talk to anymore. Mm -hmm. But yet they empower reconciliation with those ancestors that we trampled upon. But when it comes to their elite five or six that they legitimately have written off, primarily former lovers who never behaved according to the separation pattern that was acceptable. And I don't know about you, who in your life are you estranged from? I would say on your palate, uh, reconciliation, but I'm never going to reach out to them, but I'm going to talk to myself about them. What prevents me to include them in my heart of non-write-off? And God forbid you ever reached across the divide of legitimate separation. Well, they wronged me. They trigger me. What about the spiritual courage to, as Nelson Mandela became such close friends with his jailer? The Dalai Lama used the term of the Chinese who committed genocide, my enemy, my friends. In Burma, the art of non-demonization of the enemy who raped our daughters and imprisoned and tortured us. I think one of the greatest gifts that we can give each other is for Netanyahu, the leader of Hamas, Biden, Putin, Zelensky, the prime ministers of other countries, Macron, Trudeau. What a gift to the world of saying, let's talk. Even on Zoom and Skype, and let's just beam that conversation of unlimited hatred for each other to the world. At least we're not going to legitimately kill each other until tomorrow. But let's just spew madness at each other and show that we can still think as human animals. You're the animal who doesn't understand the art of reconciliation as a language I've sat in judicial court for the better part of 10 years because my former partner and I could not talk over a beloved, incredible child. Tragedy. And I cannot emphasize enough, whoa, whoa, who in the world right now that we've loved, we've touched, we've eroticized, we've sensualized. I've got, there's three or four people that I kind of sort of wish I could have, but no, and certain women too, and others who passed on that, God, what a constellation that would be to show that where we once loved, now we took it higher. I don't mean to get back into each other's romantic, erotic, aromantic, trans, polyamorous relationships. I'm just saying we laughed, we cried, we touched, we bathed, we showered. Why can't we laugh and be community again in 
an attempt at agreed upon prose and poetry and gifts and at least open the door. Hi, I'm still here. Right? Why? So these are, that's, it sounds radical, but I'm saying sometimes the greatest overlook healing is not with ourselves, but is with ourselves, with the people that we've loved before they die. And believe me, I've been at the edge of this dying story now for two and a half years, which you have too. And God, how beautiful it would be just to say hello where there's no conversation. And why? It's vulnerable to be vulnerable, to be rejected. It's better to be right with might than to be rejected with honesty and intimacy. And I think men overlook how hard it is to be vulnerable and intimate, to state the obvious. And I think this is a male-driven war, as most of them are. And whatever that male psyche is, it seems to be rooted in the pathology of violence as might is right. And we call that freedom justice. We call them terrorists. And as Noam Chomsky said, you want to stop terrorism? Stop participating in it. Mm. Thank you, Alan. So I'm going to end there and just save the rest of it for the retreat. Other upcoming things, I've got lots of different personal programs. I've got several books. I've mentioned psychedelic activism, a love story, an existential love story is a subtitle. And... Uh, I've got a meditation book coming out called A Meditator's Refuge, 40 Years in the Making, coming out next month. Again, the retreat at the Sentinel, God willing. Uh, reach out to Dana. Really looking forward to that. It's going to go up in the next month or two. An online application and an overview, a little bit of a video overview. And I've got a, a very surprise process that I'm halfway through. I'm not going to share what that is. It's very a joyful uh, unusual project that I'm going to put forth at a film, a documentary film, which I'm not allowed to speak about at the moment, that's very edgy. That's going to talk about a lot of the concepts. We filmed already 23 hours of the film. And we're now looking for creative and funding to take it to another level of theatrical release and hopefully streaming release. If you're a talented editor or producer or philanthropist, reach out to me and I'll tell you about it. It's small amount, but it's a profoundly interesting concept. And it's been filmed at the Bali's leading film studio. Very proud of that and some other things too. And thank you from my heart. Thank uh, you. Follow your own heart to state the obvious. Everyone at the Sentinel, Dana, from my heart to yours, thank you for your good heart, your friendship, and everyone else who's participated. Hope to see you soon. Stay in touch. And my love to you for uh, who you are and what you've brought and the courage to keep on keeping on. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So I will take departure at this point. And again, these three films will be put together and they'll be uh, sent out. We'll put them on our YouTube channel and probably within the next week or two, you'll have them if you want. And we'll send you a link to that so that you have easy access to review anything that's been recorded. And uh, thank you once again. Dana, take care and thank everyone at the Sentinel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It was Thanks. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you again. Bye-bye.